Hello, my beautiful students. Good morning. You're welcome to this beautiful biology class. And I hope you're still keeping up the faith. God loves you so much. Be strong. You are still the best in spite of all odds. Keep up the good faith. You're more than a conqueror. Don't give in to the lockdown situation. As we go into this, our beautiful topic, crop and animal diseases. Crop and animal diseases. This is an extension of our last topic. You know we've been treating on pests and diseases of farm animals, and today we'll do an extension for that. Uh, we're going to be treating crop and animal diseases specifically. And our guideline as we go on in this topic our specific objectives, at the end of this lesson, I should be able to define crop and animal diseases, state some crop and animal diseases, describe their pathogens and effects to agriculture. These are going to be our guidelines, as you can see on your screen. Let's go on to the definitions. In our definition, Crop and animal diseases are the abnormal conditions or the malfunctioning of crops and animals as a result of the activities of pathogenic and non-pathogenic agents. In our environment, we have a lot of things that can cause diseases, both on humans and in agricultural products. Now, when we say pathogenic and no pathogenic agents, we are going to define and make it clear what these things are. Let's start. What are pathogenic and non pathogenic agents? Number one, patho pathogens are disease causing living organisms. They are disease causing living organisms. Any organism capable of causing an abnormal negative condition on another living thing is a pathogen. Typical examples include virus, bacteria, parasitic protozoans, fungi, worms, that is the flatworms and the nematodes. These are parasitic in nature and they can inflict diseases on the body of other living things. So we designate them with the name pathogens, and they are disease-causing living organisms. Their activities result to diseases in other living organisms, even in farm animals and farm crops. Let's go on to the next definition, which is the non-pathogenic agents. The non-pathogenic agents also affect crops and animals, now, what do we mean by non-pathogenic agents? Non-pathogenic agents are non-living things that cause dysfunctioning of the bodies of living organisms. They cause dysfunctioning of, of the bodies of living organisms. Now, in this case, this ag these agents are not made of living matter. They are made of non-living matter. An example among these non-pathogenic agents are the mutagenic agents themselves. The mutagenic agents. What do we mean by mutagenic agents? Those agents that can cause what is called mutation in biology. And what is mutation? Mutation is the alteration or the change in the genetic makeup of a living organism. In other words, if there is an alteration, if no matter how little, if there is an alteration or change in the genome of a particular organism is going to result in what is called mutation. Such mutations can delete a particular gene from an organism. It can disfigure it. It can change the configuration of that genome. And the resultant organism from that mutation is going to appear and behave differently from the previous generations that gave birth to it. And so mutation also brings a lot of diseases when it is in the negative form. Of course, 
according to evolutionary studies, there are some mutations that influence living things positively, but that is not our focus today. So our focus will be on the negative aspect of mutation. So mutagenic agents like radioactive materials, those materials that can radiate and give off some harmful wave, waves and radiations can affect the genome of farm animals and also farm crops and will, will hamper the productivity of such an agricultural activity. So mutagenic agents also cause diseases in plants and animals. Now, number two non-pathogenic agent are the pollutants. You know what pollutants are? Pollutants are those uh, substances that degrade our environment and make it of non-habitable condition. So what are those pollutants that can also cause diseases? We have a lot of them, just a few I will mention. We have gamalin 20, which fishermen use, uh, use to make a lot of uh, catching of fishes, but that has become a serious pollutant to our farm animals as well. Also, we have the DDT. The DDT is an insecticide which also affects other living things around. Irrespective of the fact that it's being used as a pesticide, it has been scientifically recognized as one of the cancer-causing pollutants in our environment. And so the DDT also causes a lot of diseases in farm animals. And what's the full meaning of DDT? The, the full meaning of DDT, DDT is dichlorodiphenyl trichloroethane. It's an organochlorine which affects every other living organism. Now we have fertilizers. Yes, you shouldn't be surprised about that. Fertilizers also affect other living organisms negatively, apart from making our crops to grow bigger and uh, give us more yield. It is also a pollutant to the environment. When it is washed off into rivers, it affects fishes. And if it comes into areas like fish ponds and the rest of the uh, pond-based agriculture, it will affect our farm animals. Fertilizer is there, mercury, lead, two of the most dangerous pollutants in the world. They affect the nervous system of living things, mostly animals, of course, and they can cause death. They are so fatal, they can cause death in their spreading. Now, we also have industrial waste. Industrial waste are pollutants. Another harmful um, uh, non-pathogenic agent are the radiations, the harmful radiations. You have the gamma rays, which are part of radiations that can be given off from radioactive elements. And in any other capacity that radiation can occur, gamma rays, when they occur, they can also cause mutation. So you can still classify them under the mutagenic agents. All right, now you've seen those things that can cause diseases both the pathogenic and the non-pathogenic agents. Let's get on with the diseases we are talking about. On your screen, you can see uh, leaves of crops of agricultural importance that have been infected or affected by some infections. Of course, that is not the color of leaves of plant. The natural color of leaves of plant is green. And what is that green? The green is the chlorophyll, the presence of chlorophyll, which is used for photosynthesis. And you know that photosynthesis yields a lot of carbohydrate for the plant, with which the plant gains a lot of energy to carry out its metabolic activities. Now, in this case, this is no longer at the natural state. It has been altered by a disease. But let's look at what type of disease. It's called the rust disease. The rust disease is a fungal disease that attack plants like maize, millet, wheat. It is characterized by the appearance of brown, red, or rusty spots on leaves. Just as you've seen on your screen, I will still take you back to that slide so that you can see how this disease affects the leaves of crops. 
it may also appear as a rusty stripe or as rusty stripes on the leaves of maize. Now, by the crops I've mentioned, you can see that this particular disease mostly affects cereals. Cereals like maize, willet, and wheat, and the other cereals there. Now, you find out that once this disease, as you can see on your screen, as I've put it back for you, you can see the reddish-brown coloration of leaves, which is impeding the activities of the chlorophyll and makes it practically impossible for the plant to produce carbohydrate. And you know what this is going to result? Gradually, the plant is going to wither and die off. And when it affects a whole field of crops, it is the end of that farm because definitely they are not going to produce carbohydrate. And without carbohydrate, no energy production. So the rust disease, like I told you, is a fungal disease. It's, called, it's caused by a fungus, and it attacks the leaves of plants, changes the color thereby. The next one we're going to talk about is the smut disease. We're just picking a few of these diseases because time and uh, space will not allow us to treat all the diseases that are obtainable in crops. So I'm only picking a little. We are done with the rust disease. We are now treating the smut disease. This is yet another disease caused by a fungus. In fact, among crops, the most pathogenic agent among crops is the fungus. And there are so many species of the fungi. So we've just treated the first disease. The second one, like I said, is the small disease. How does this disease appear? Let's go ahead. This is a disease caused by a fungus and is characterized by the appearance of spores. You know what are spores? Round objects and structures formed by living organisms as a means of reproduction to increase their generation in a particular environment. That's what these spores are. They are reproductive structures produced by living organisms. Now, they may appear as black spores or yellow spores. The spores can be formed on the leaves, stem, or cob of cereals and affect great damage. It influences a lot of great damage on crops. Now, the small disease, I'm going to show you what it looks like, the appearance, the characteristics of small disease. Remember, it is caused by the fungus. Now, look at these crops on your screen. You can see a lot of spores. Let me show you one of the spores on the screen. This black accumulation of spores, that is the small disease. Now, this is another accumulation of the spores formed by the fungus, and it is impeding the physiological function of these cereals. Look at another one, and you can see how they appear so disgusting to the sight. As they appear disgusting to the sight, so they are disgusting to the physiological functioning of the cereal. It degrades the function of this particular crop. Now, go to the next picture. You can see a yellowish spore forming on this cereal, another spore, and this is also another spore. These spores are in their thousands, as you can see, because they are very minute in size. But for them to appear in this size, that means there are thousands of them. And you can imagine, this is just only in one crop. You can imagine when they are in almost half of the crop in a farm, and these spores can be dispersed by wind to other crops, and it can affect them and destroy their ability to continue with metabolic activities. Now, look at another uh, spore that is formed here. This particular, this is a maize cob. And inside, you can't see anything like maize brain anymore. You can't see any maize seed here. All you are seeing is the whole cob covered by spores, fungal spores, and nobody can consume this kind of maize because it's already destroyed. This is a typical disease among cereals and other crops, and it's called the smart disease. Now let's go to the next disease, 
which is the root rot disease. The root rot disease is yet another fungal disease. What does this root rot disease uh, appear like? First and foremost, it causes, before I talk about the appearance, it causes the decay of roots, thereby weakening its functions of absorption, anchorage, conduction, support, and storage. These are the activities or functions of root to crops. But look at it, the moment the roots begins to decay, all these functions are altered. Now, when the fungus that causes this root rot disease attacks the roots, it's going to cause the roots to turn to black color. And once they turn to black color, they lose every of both anatomical and physiological components. Nothing can go on anymore. You find out that when something decays, its ability to carry out metabolic activity is zero. And so this is a very fatal disease that affects crops of agricultural importance. And so the root rot disease, I will show you how it appears in the roots of plants. This is one of them on this particular crop. You can see that the roots are already decaying. Another one, on this particular crop, you can see the root is no longer looking healthy. It has been destroyed completely by the uh, fungus, and it has made this root to be of no effect. As a result, the plant can no longer absorb, number one, the, uh, absorb mineral salts and water. The plant can no longer support the entire plant, I mean the root, can no longer support the entire plant to be anchored, to be made erect. It will be tilting and falling downwards. And then another thing is that for some crops that store their food, like cassava, yam, and the rest of them that store their um, uh, carbohydrate at their root, you find out that it will no longer be possible. When you uproot such a crop, that area that is supposed to be storing food will be already be decayed. And so the root rot disease affects crops. Now, the last, or not exactly the last, let me still go further because I want to touch these diseases one after the other. Now, the next one is the mosaic disease. The mosaic disease is a viral disease. It is caused by virus. And it is a disease caused by virus and can be transmitted by vectors like aphids. Remember in our previous class that we treated about the aphid as a pest of crop of agricultural importance. And you know that the aphid has a mouth part called the proboscis. And when it inserts the proboscis into the stem or any other part of the plant to suck out the stored food in them, it can also transmit virus into this particular crops that is, you know, pesting on. And when this virus goes in, it's going to make the leaves of those crops to appear gray in color. In other words, it's going to have patches of grayish color on them, and that also impedes the capability of the chlorophyll to produce food. As you can see on your screen, you can see the patches, the grayish patches that appear on the leaves of this particular plant. And it can affect plants like tobacco, it can affect plants like cassava, okay? And it's a deadly disease too. So if nothing is done to this, in most cases, if you want to control this type of disease, the best thing to do is to destroy those crops that are already affected or else it's going to be transmitted to other crops. But I will leave the control for your assignments. Let's continue for the next disease. Now, the next and the last disease I want to touch on crop disease is the bacterial blight. The bacterial blight is a disease, of course, from the name. You will know that it is caused by bacteria. It is a disease which deposits reddish brown spots on the leaves and stems of plants. These spots later turn black, destroying the entire plant. It's caused by bacterium, and this bacterium affects the entire part of a plant, causing it to have, at times, reddish coloration, 
and some brown uh, uh, coloration, which will later turn black. That is the effect of this particular bacterium on plants. It mostly affects plants like cotton and some other plants like uh, tobacco plants and so many other crops that are of agricultural importance. So there are so many diseases. I've only taken time to highlight on these few ones. Let me quickly go over to diseases that affect farm animals. Uh, this is the picture of the bacterial blight of how it appears on a leaf. Now, when you come to animal diseases, some animals have a lot of diseases, and among some of those diseases that can be found in farm animals include trypanosomiasis, which is the common sleeping sickness. Then you have the liver fluke, which affects the liver of mammals. Then you have the tapeworm infestation. You have the render pest disease. You have the bovine disease. You have the Newcastle disease. There are so many of them. We'll just take a few from these ones highlighted on your screen. Let's take trypanosomiasis, which is also known as sleeping sickness. It is caused by the trypanosomiasis. This is a disease caused by a parasitic protozoan called trypanosoma. At the critical stage of this disease, the lymph nodes and the central nervous system are affected and can cause death. Now, according to what, you, what has been read for you, trypanosoma is a protozoan, is a unicellular organism, which is highly parasitic in nature. I'm going to be showing you the picture as we are going to see on the right hand side, the picture on the right hand side, which is this. This is trypanosoma. A diagram of trypanosoma that causes trypanosomiasis. Now, it's a single cell organism and highly destructive in the blood of mammals. It is transmitted by this particular vector called sesefly. Now, I will talk a little bit on the life cycle of sesefly, which is a vector that transmits the pathogen trypanosoma. But what are the effects of trypanosoma in the blood and body of farm animals? After it has been injected by the sesa fly it, through its bite, just the same way when mosquito is feeding on a human blood and through it mosquito can transmit plasmodium. That is exactly the same method when the sesa fly is feeding on a farm animal and the proboscis is inserted. As the propose is going to the skin of the animal and the sesa fly regurgitates its saliva in order to cause, uh, in order to make the blood to be anti-coagulative in nature. In other words, it's going to make it not to coagulate. It will continue to be fluid as it sucks it in. Now, it's an anticoagulant that the saliva of the sesa fly is going to be to the blood. As he's doing so, the trypanosoma moves out from the salivary gland and moves in with the saliva into the blood. It infects the farm animal and within a matter of days and weeks, the animal will start showing the symptoms. It will start showing all manner of high temperature, feverish condition, and most of the time, by the time the parasite has gone to the nervous system, you will notice that the animal, it also affects human beings, you will notice that the animal is always in a sleeping mood. And that is why it is given that common name, sleeping sickness. And this sickness is a deadly disease. If not treated on time, the animal will surely die. Even in humans, if they are not well treated, the individual can die. So this is a typical disease that affects farm animals. Now, talking about the vector, talking about the vector itself, which is the sesa fly. The sesa fly has complete metamorphosis, 
but it also carries out what is called viviparity in its mode of reproduction. It, lay, uh, it gives birth to the larva. It doesn't lay egg like other insects. It gives birth to the larva alive. And also, it has complete life cycle. That is complete metamorphosis. This is the larva. And from larva stage, it's going to develop into the pupa stage. Already from the body of the adult sesame fly, the egg hatches inside the body while the larva is giving birth to, and then to pupa, which will finally metamorphose in the adult sesame fly. And it goes about feeding on the blood of mammals, even farm animals. All right, so much for it for the trypanosomiasis. Let's treat another disease of farm animals called the liver fluke disease. The liver fluke disease, of course, is caused by a uh, parasitic worm belonging to the phylum platyhelminthes. The platyhelminthes are mostly flatworms, and two classes out of the three are highly parasitic, which affects both farm animals and humans. Now, one of them is this one called the fluke. It has a scientific name of Fasciola hepatica or Fasciola gigantica, the Fasciola species. Now, this is a pathogen that has a life cycle with an intermediate host. What do we mean by an intermediate host? A host that can harbor the organism and help it to metamorphose into the next level of its life development. And that particular intermediate host is called the snail, the water snail. We are going to be seeing how this organism in its developmental stages affects living organisms. Now, as you can see on your screen, this is caused by a parasitic flatworm called Fasciola species. Sorry for that, it's Fasciola species. It attacks the liver of most mammals like sheep, pig, cattle, etc. It has an intermediate host during its life cycle, just like I've told you, the water snail, as can be seen in this particular life cycle. If possible, I want you to find a way to download this particular life cycle so that you can settle down and understand its movement. First and foremost, the eggs of Fasciola is being exuded into the environment by fecal defecation. When both humans and animals that are infected, when they defecate, this particular fasciola, the eggs which were in the intestine, are now pushed into the environment. It can be on the ground, it can be by the riverside, but they have the ability to maintain their existence for a very long time. And so whenever the condition is right for them is going to hatch into a particular larva called Mirasidium. Mirasidium swims in water and when it meets the water snail, it penetrates the body and further develops inside the body of the water snail. Then it's going to metamorphose into what is called the Secaria worm. Now the Secaria worm is going to leave the body of the snail and be insisted and be deposited anywhere in the environment. It can be on the grass by the riverside or by the waterside or any other place. And it's going to form what is called encystment, which is a hard covering that prevents anything from harming that particular secaria. Now, it has not developed to the adult fasciola. It's going to remain like this, even for months, possibly a year, without undergoing further changes until another organism will come and be feeding on a grass that is infected with the cyst of secaria. Now, when that organism feeds on it, paraventure, it might be that of sheep, it will go into the body of the sheep and begin to do what is called migration. It moves from the intestine to the liver of the sheep, where it will cause a lot of harm. And that is why it is called the liver fluke. Now, when humans feed on farm animals that are infected with fluke, they will also be infected with a lot of the eggs of the particular, if the meat is not well cooked. At the right-hand side of your screen, 
this particular place, you can see this is the picture of the fasciola, that is the fluke. The flat worm is a microscopic picture of it because it's somehow small. Nevertheless, you can see big ones, you can see them with an aided eye. You can see them very well. But look at it here, it has suckers and hooks at this particular point. That's the anterior end and this is the posterior end. Now it has suckers and hooks. This is where you have the suckers. The hooks at times can be all over the body with which it attaches itself to the liver and migrates to the uh, gallbladder where it's going to block so many um, outlets and cause indigestion, diseases and impediments in the animal. It affects the growth of farm animals. Now, these are some of the diseases that affect farm animals, which I have treated for you here. But I would want you on your own, as a student of high class, to please go further and study on the control measures for these crop and animal diseases. And I want you as much as you can get at least, at least four control measures for these diseases, both in that of crops and that of animals. And you know where to submit it in your Google Classroom. I will stop here for today and I want to thank you so much for watching and being part of this class. Continue to be the best in spite of all odds. Thank you.